I knew one thing when I took that job, that I was on a mission. That's my phone, but don't worry about it. Oh. <laughs> that's probably, it's probably the president calling, but I'll get, I'll get back to him later. I'm in the middle of an interview and you're f***ing it up. You be on fly duty when it comes in. Okay. All right. There it is there. And it, it likes your pants. Oh, got it. Oh, coach. You did it. Get him? Yeah. Yes, there is. Right. Right. All right, let's roll. You going to be a football player when you grow up? Mm -hmm. Today is the best day of your life. Believe it. He might be the finest quarterback produced in the last 10 years. Philadelphia Eagles select Donovan McNabb. Said, I'm the best decision this organization has ever made. Yeah, he, he, he's be like, that's all I need. Fortunately for me, I didn't lose my life, didn't lose my job. Football convinced me that life is a team game. That's right, it's a game for men. That's the life. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it. Was this the final game on the sidelines for a great coach? I want to thank you very much for making my day in the sun. When I was young, I was tremendously competitive. I mean, whether that's right, wrong, or otherwise, I can't help it. As you get older, you start understanding. It's not that important. But back then, it was essential that I, I had a win. Somebody wrote once that he had a face like a fist. He played football and he coached football the only way he knew how, and that's just beat the guy across from you every single play. I think he was a throwback, you know. He, he could have played in any era. He's a legend. Iron Mike Powers for the final 30 yards on a 47-yard play. He's Iron Mike. You remember him as one of the toughest players to ever put on a helmet and shoulder pads. Mike Ditka played a game with a dislocated ankle, pops it back in and keeps playing. As a player, he was, he was the greatest. Wish we had a ton in there like him now in the NFL. Carl Sandburg once described Chicago as husky, stormy, and brawling. He could have been writing about Mike Ditka. Don't change it. Run a shoot. I don't give a run the shoot, catch the ball. And Steve, line him up and run it. He has to kick ass all the time. He needs to do that. <laughs> See that? That's your IQ, buddy. Zero. Hold up, turn over. Son. I'd rather talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you get the I know, I know I'm smarter than that. <laughs> this is the best picture that describes Ditka. No, no, no holds barred Ditka. Perfect. No holds barred is what makes Ditka a popular radio and TV commentator. The, the Players Association today represents nobody but the present players, which is wrong. Here's the deal. That's the extended one. Now when you keep it here, you come on in. Now, now, <laughs> you no, are dealing no, right, punishment. Right. That's your way of getting even, Tommy. Heaven knows Ditka was no saint, except for the three seasons he coached in New Orleans. The way he coached, he was able to embody a lot of those old school values, but do it in a very original and unique way. You see the scoreboard? Don't celebrate. Lay off to celebrate and act like you've done it before. That's childish. That's an amateur act. Uh, number 26 is saying why I holler at him. Because he can't play. For crying out loud! That's a bunch of crap! His temper is legendary, and, and his uh, intensity is legendary. All you got to do is want it as much as we know we want it. We don't want it that much. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, go. Let's go. He's the ultimate motivator. He's the ultimate passionate man. I think we became a team today. We became a team. Yeah. Mike was always intense. He was intense from the time I first met him, which may have been eight or nine years old. If you did something wrong, he'd point it out to you, you know, even as a kid. And that's the way Mike was. Well, I, I, I think that I am truly a product of, of, of America. For young Mike Ditka, America was Aliquippa, a western Pennsylvania mill town located in the heart of steel country. 
Aliquippa was a, a unique place. It was a, the epitome of America, the American dream. It was a melting pot of every color, creed, nationality, and religion. And it worked. You know why? Everybody had about the same thing. They had an opportunity to raise their families, to have a job, to put food on the table. My father worked hard. He worked in a steel mill. He was a union negotiator for the railroad. And he negotiated contracts that were like very unheard of. He'll tell you his dad was the real Iron Mike. <laughs> I was raised by a father who was not afraid to take the belt out and whip you. And uh, he wasn't worried about what people thought or the neighbors thought when I cried, when I got hit. And I did. I got hit a lot. I was about seven years old at the time. And I went up into the woods. I lit a cigarette and started puffing on it. Got dizzy. <laughs> Dropped a cigarette, burned the woods down. Uh, my dad came home, he said, he's looking out the window, he said, what happened to the woods? He said, my mother said, you gotta ask your son. I got the worst beating you've ever seen. And, but you know, I deserved it. The son inherited the father's demanding nature, and this fueled his competitive fire at an early age. I seen him hit his own brother, because his brother oh, messed I up a play. We played little league baseball. And Ashton did misjudge a fly ball. And Mike did chase him. He chased him to, to center field over the fence. And I already knocked him out. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did chase him. I don't think I decked him off. At Aliquippa High School, Dicka was a two platoon player and team captain for head coach Carl Ashman. He played on the Quip state championship team in 1955. Two years later, Ditka was a highly coveted recruit. Coach Ashman wanted me to go to Pitt, and he wanted me to go to Pitt because he wanted me to go to Pitt and become a dentist. So that was it. So I went to Pitt and took pre-dental courses for about four semesters, and then I became a history major because it wasn't very easy. Ditka was a two-way end at Pitt, where his defensive skills helped him earn All-American honors. On offense, he caught few passes, but his versatility made him an attractive pro prospect. In 1961, he was the Chicago Bears' first round draft choice. First of all, I wasn't sure I could play pro football because most of my prowess in college or, or notoriety came as a defensive player. And then when I get to the Bears, all of a sudden I'm playing a position called tight end. And no one knew what the heck it was, really. I mean, it was kind of a new position. Billy Wade finds his great rookie, Mike Ditko, open and whips the ball to him. Iron Mike completes a 36 yard TD strike. You know, I caught 12 passes my senior year in college. 12. I caught 58 my first year in pro ball and 12 touchdowns. Ditka was the NFL's Rookie of the Year. The first thing that Mike did is change the tight end position to an attack position. Before Mike Ditka came along, the tight ends were guys that blocked, and once in a while you throw them a pass and they get a 10-yard completion. Mike Ditka changed all that because he could get downfield and he transformed the, the tight end to position to kind of what it is now. Ditka was the first tight end to be used as an offensive weapon. He would eventually become the first tight end inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I could never outrun anybody. I had to wait till they catch up and try to slug them. Ditka was not selective about who he slugged. The Saturday night game against the Rams in the LA Coliseum. And all of a sudden, we're in the huddle, and Mike says, Wait a minute, I'll be back. That drunk fan had run out on the field in the Coliseum, and Dick ran over and just decked him. I mean, psh, one blow right to the chops, down he went. He comes back to the huddle and says, Okay, let's go. Iron Mike was one of the fiercest competitors of his era. He was voted to five Pro Bowls during his six seasons in Chicago. In 1963, Ditka helped the Bears win a world championship, but he and head coach George Hallis were on a collision course. The impact would change Ditka's career and life. Mike, I think the folks would like to see you uh, diagram one of your favorite pass patterns. Will you do it? What was uh, negotiating with George Hallis like? Hard. 
hard. <laughs> you didn't win. <laughs> and I had some great debates with him about money, and uh, I never won any of them, but that's okay. I made 18000 my first year, including salary and bonus, and uh, I went in for, uh, uh, for a contract my second year. After the year, I had rookie of the year, and I caught a lot of touchdowns and this and that, so I went in, and, and he wanted to pay me fourteen. And I said, that's a cut. He said, no, it's a raise. He does a coach, that's not a raise. He said, what do you mean? I said, I made 18 last year. So no, he made 12. I said, I made 18. Listen, the 12 and the 6 is 18. And I told him I wouldn't sign for a penny less than 18. As soon as I said that, he pulled out a contract for 18 and I signed it. The moral of the story is very simply this. He was willing to pay 18, but he, he would have taken me for 14. He got credit for saying that George Hallis threw nickels around like manhole covers. And uh, I don't know if he really said that, but it happened to be true. Frustrated by his salary battles with Hallis, Ditka signed with the AFL's Houston Oilers. But when the rival leagues merged, he remained in Chicago, where Papa Bear ultimately tired of his wayward son. I was a pain in the ass. Simply spoke, you know, I was a pain in the ass and I, I wore out my welcome. So Hallis traded uh, Ditka. Maybe part of it was out of spite. It was a big mistake, but they had very similar personalities. I played two years in Philadelphia, and they never got over it. <laughs> that's why the fans are so mad? Yeah, that's why they boo so much. How, how? They started with me. As a player and as a man, Ditka crash-landed in Philadelphia. He didn't want to be there. He played for a bad team. Didn't like the coaching staff and didn't, uh, mainly didn't like himself. He, he started drinking and, and admitted it was a problem. It's a cop-out. You know, when you, you, know, you find people who, who uh, lean on alcohol or drugs, then they're, they're copping out, they're weak. And I became weak at that time. And that was, that was a person I didn't like very much in my life. I had no career after Philadelphia. I was retiring when I got the phone call from Coach Landry. And he told me very honestly, said, I traded for you, he said, but I'm not sure you can play anymore. He said, I'll take a chance on you if you take a chance on yourself. I have so much uh, thankfulness for knowing him and meeting him and, and him helping me that uh, it's, it's really incredible. And I probably became the best player I ever was in Dallas because I became a team player. I didn't care how many passes I caught or how many touchdowns I made. I cared about the success of the Cowboys and Coach Landry and my teammates, and I really did, and I can honestly say that. I was part of Tom's first one, and, and God, that was, that was great. Tom, I dropped back to pass. That's up. Pass to him. Touchdown! That was more important to me than when I won in 85. I mean it. Ditka played for three years in Dallas. Then, in 1973, Landry asked him to become special teams coach. He served eight seasons as a Cowboys assistant, but he yearned to be a head coach, and there was only one team he wanted to lead. I said, what is your goal? You want to just be an assistant the rest of your life? And he goes, no, I want to be a head coach, and I want to coach the Bears. And I said, why don't you write George Hallis a letter and say if the position ever becomes available, then you'd be interested in talking to him. I wrote him a letter in 1978, and I told him that, you know, I'd like to come back and uh, rectify the terms that I left on, which weren't very good, and I thought someday I'd be ready to be the head coach of the Bears. I told him at that time I wasn't ready yet, but I said someday I will be ready and like the opportunity to uh, return the Bears to what you meant him to be. Now, as I present, Mike, to you, please treat him as nicely as you did Well, the general perception time. was, we love Mike Ditka, he's an iconic player, but this is no head coach. It's an opportunity of a lifetime for me, it's something I've looked forward to. He knew that I had a thing called bear pride and I think that was important to him. Both had a kind of a single mindedness about us and, and, and a common goal, the purpose was to, to make the Bears special. I mean the Bears were his life and they became my life. That was the only job I ever wanted, the only job I really ever had that was worth it, anything to me. This is our kick-ass shred. This is our top of the line. It's our blend. It's about 60% Zippendale. I and mean, when you come here, you just, you see his name on it and you get it. Coach has a book, First in Life, You Must Kick Ass, 
This is our franchise. Mike Ditka's kick-ass cigar. I've done everything. I mean, I've got wine, hot sauce. Ditka's real barbecue sauce. Shredded beef. Mike Ditka's Italian beef. I've got ribs. Mike Ditka kick-ass bloody Mike mix. I got everything. What the heck? I'm multidimensional. At first, the Mike Ditka brand was a tough sell in Chicago. Get out of the weak side, you dumb son of a Get in there, Mosley. He was brutish. He was volatile. He had a perm. We gotta pick each other up. Come on. Let's just roll after him as hard as you can. He was exactly what the Bears needed. I wanted the Bears to be the best. I wanted the Bears to have the best reputation. I wanted them to be the toughest, and I wanted to win the championship. And I told our team when I got there. I got good news and bad news. The good news is we're going to win a Super Bowl here. The bad news is a lot of you people aren't going to be here when we do it. And that's, I didn't mean that to be cruel. I meant it to be factual. That if you weren't willing to pay the price, you weren't going to be there, period. Stay out! Stay out! Give me a half back! Get him the f*** out of here! People thought he would be a failure before he started. It was too emotional. You know, it wears thin in a hurry. I want it done right. Sometimes I maybe didn't do it in the most appealing way to the players, but that's tough. If they, if they got their feelings hurt, I really apologize. Ditka was not an easy man to get along with. So you called your husband Coach or Mike? Ass. <laughs> and nobody knew that better than the quarterbacks who played for him in New Orleans and Chicago. Well, he was tough on quarterbacks, there's no doubt. But, you know, playing in that offense is not good for quarterbacks anyway. I mean, it's the most boring offense I've ever been in my life. Well, there's no question about it. I like to throw the football more. But, uh, you know, as long as Walter's around, uh, we're not going to be a passing football team. I mean, everybody knows. Third and long, we're going to run sweep with Walter. So I just call something else. Yeah, the play he threw the Willie for a touchdown was his own call. It was not my call. And, uh, he just took it on his own. He raced the running play and took that and went with it and made a TD. And he did blow up a lot of times. He'd yell at me, I yelled back at him, and everything was fine. Mike always thought I did it just to piss him off. And I didn't. I wanted to win football games. Come on, offense! Let's go! Diana, his wife, would always tell me, you know, Mike really likes you. I said, well, why is he calling me at so-and-so for three hours every day? McMahon wasn't the only one. As Flutie throws and nearly has that one picked off, Dipta is going to eat a sneaker. Flutie changed at the line of scrimmage. <laughs> He's got more head by the, by the jersey. Get in there and tell him what I want done. Get him out of there. Give me the quarterback. Let it go. I had every guy in the world named Billy Bob in New Orleans. Bobby, 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 Bobby. Billy Joe. Joe Bob, Tom Bob, Billy Bob, Bill Bob. The ball's got to go. The ball's got to go out, Red. That's what's killing us. Throw the ball. It's a matter of doing the right things. Was I too hard on him? Yeah, I probably was. Uh, would I change it? No, I wouldn't. We're not going to run dive G. All right. Forget it. Okay. He just expects you to be mentally tough. He expects you to be a football player. Uh, he expects you to be hard. And those are the kind of guys he wanted playing for him. That's the kind of guy he is himself. you got to love it. He was this way as a player. He'd come back and practically punch out his own quarterback. Ditka remade the Bears in his image. Tough-nosed players who didn't take crap from anyone. McMahon looks into the end zone, throws in there deep. A diving grab for the touchdown every morning. In 1984, Ditka led the Bears to their first postseason victory in 20 years. The players fed off his raw emotion, and so did the press. Man, this is what it's all about. I mean, people are getting snot knocked out of them out there. That's a good football game, boy. I mean, I don't care what the score was. They beat us. It was still a good football game. It, the, the people were hitting each other. That, that's what this is all about. They, they didn't back down from us, and we didn't back down from them. And they, that was a heck of a game. Anybody could have won it. We were lucky to win it. So I mean, I'll take the luck. I'm, I'm tired of the skill. Mike <laughs> It was must-see theater when Mike did his post-game press conferences. We're proud of our people. We like our people. For those who don't like our people, that's tough. We like them. His heart was out on his sleeve, and what he, what he felt and what he thought, he said. Somebody better wake up, because we are not nearly as good as we think we are. At times, it, it became a little bit adversarial. If you think this is a damn soap opera, you're full of it was like a bear in a cage, and you, know, you can poke it a little here, and it'll, you know, pot. And then all of a sudden, you poke it the wrong way, and the thing comes at you right up to the, the cage and wants to eat you. Well, the offense in the third quarter. The offense was terrible. Yeah, the offense wasn't there because the offense didn't have the ball in the third quarter. Why is someone trying to first down? 
At what point of the game, dear? Meet is fickle. You know it and I know it. You're a hero today, you're a bum tomorrow. Took me a little longer to figure it out, but once I did, I treated them all the same. Like dirt. There's three quarterbacks on this football team. Whichever one starts, starts. Whichever ones don't, we'll back him up. Period. Cut and dried. It's nobody's concern but ours. Nobody's. Next. I didn't stand up in front of them to get confrontational. They brought on the questions. I answered them. Mike, why are you in such a bad mood? What do you care? I was easily agitated, I'll say that. I'm not, I'm not out to answer a bunch of questions about bull that I'm going to answer tonight. I'm going to answer the same thing and look at the same film tonight. Now say I'm not. Well, yes, you are, but that hasn't yeah. got anything to do with this show. Why? I don't know how that got on YouTube, but he'd go through the emotions of a game and sometimes not want to maybe do a post-game interview. You've got 43 players and nine assistant coaches out there. We're, we're getting them, too. Okay. It was during a commercial break right after the game, and I'm under the gun to get the interview and get ready, and he agreed to do it, but didn't want to do it. Jim McMahon, how serious is he? Well, as, as I told all of America's media five minutes ago, Jim will be fine, 100%. That question shouldn't be asked again. Anyway, we probably shouldn't have pushed him. You know, he didn't have his pants on, for God's sake. No, we decided it was... It, it, uh, that's crazy stuff. But I got my pants on eventually. I don't think there'll ever be a coach like him. Talking to Bill Belichick, I mean, you might as well be talking to a statue. He's secretive, he's bland, his facial expression never changes. And I, I'm not picking on Belichick, but there's many others like that. Not Ditka. Ditka was different. He was kick-ass at the podium and on the field. And to those who still doubted him, he had a message. I have this photo, I have it in a poster in my house. I remember we were together at Bill Walsh's funeral and Coach Ditka leaned over and said to me, he said, listen, Jim, you're gonna have your critics. Screw them. That's what that picture tells me. Mike Ditka is a busy man a radio and television personality who likes to stick to a schedule. Okay. What time do we got to be uh, at the show? Right tonight? now, sports center. <laughs> Come on, guys, this is bull. Come on. He's an analyst whose right, philosophy uh, hasn't changed much since ages. he left the sidelines. I would run the football. You run the football three times. If you get in the end zone, good. If you don't, kick it through the upright. That's all. We're going to run the ball in there now. That's all there is to it. You go with your blunt lead or you go with your power lead. I don't care what you want to do. I mean, it reminds me, you know, when you're like a kid, you see these comics, somebody knocks on your door, you open the door, and they, they hit you right in the face. That's exactly what they did. Tell Fridge to tee off on the center, to yeah. drill the center. Yeah. Don't, don't you got to knock your out of center. That attitude was the driving force behind the 1985 Bears, a team led by Walter Payton, Jim McMahon, and Buddy Ryan's 46 defense. <laughs> A defense that still resonates today. Hey, fellas, fellas, what are they, unblockable? Is that the 85 Bears over there? You could see certain games where someone couldn't pick up blitzes, couldn't pick blitzes up on that 46, and you go, oh my God. I mean, it's like one, two, three, boom, just going down. You know, even if somebody got open downfield, the quarterback was usually laying down or running for his life. The Bears ground the life out of their opponents, like an over-chewed stick of gum. They embarrassed the NFC's top teams on their way to a 15-1 record. They were the Bruise Brothers, the Grabowskis, a perfect reflection of their Steel Town coach. It was the Grabowskis. You know, those were the guys who, who, who packed the lunch bucket. They went to work. They worked all day. And when a job was done, they got home. That's what we were going to do. We were going to outwork people. We were going to outsource people. We are going to outhit people. And that's what the Grabowskis were going to be. Started with good tempo now. Be smart, let's go right down, let's pin him in, let the right defense go to work. Right Look at the postseason when they came together like no team ever has. They gave up 10 points in three games. They toyed with their opponents. McMahon rolling left, looking to deal. He fired the left side of the end zone. The Super Bowl? The Super Bowl in New Orleans, it was like there was one team in town. We've earned the right, now we gotta go out and take it away. We wish you the best. The Patriots were the Washington Generals waiting to be sacrificed to the Globetrotters. 
this defense has been incredible. <laughs> they knock your socks off just to watch it. First and goal from the one yard line. Hand off the to the Chris. Chris. <laughs> when it was over, Mike Ditka reigned as the king of Chicago. Would you enjoy me? At that time, the Bears couldn't do a whole lot of wrong, and neither could I. What if the Bears, what if they all missed their wake-up call on Sunday, and, and you had to play every position? How much would you beat Dallas by? <laughs> it was on Saturday Night Live, and then it was a music video. Then it became, you know, what's the coach doing now? Is he picking his nose? What the hell? You want one of this too? <laughs> it became, it was, it was ridiculous. It was difficult being with him, period. We'd be dancing on the dance floor and some woman would come up and knock me out of the way. He was great for TV. I don't think there was anybody ever in Chicago television history that people glued to or wanted to hear from. You know, what's he going to say next? I tell you, John, the game's passed us and you were great. But you were running away from people. I didn't, you know, I don't know. <laughs> he had his own show and his own restaurant. He was in high demand as a motivational speaker. I believe that attitudes are contagious. Is yours worth catching? I am my victim. And he endorsed countless products, including his own. Bitka's limousine service is the best in town. If it wasn't, it wouldn't have my name on it. I mean, I can't think of what he didn't endorse. There was a time when it's you could have gotten him to do anything. What are you looking at? He can't say no. People ask him to do things, and he's, yeah, sure, I'll do it, you know. <laughs> it's what you get your I think you say yes to everybody. He had more commercials than any of the other players, and the players sometimes would complain. As Ditka's popularity soared, the players soured on Iron Mike. Jimbo Covert and Jay Hilgenberg had just negotiated a deal to do Chunky Soup. And I'll uh, never forget, um, Dick comes in and into our meeting tells everybody it's time for us to back off on all the endorsements. And so Jimbo and, and Jay backed off. That year we played the Pittsburgh Steelers. And on Saturday night, the Iron Mike for Chunky Soup commercial started to run. Now Falfa Sprouts, looks like wimp food to me. You, Chunky. Get over here! I think at that point, Mike lost the respect of, of all of us. And it was pretty much downhill from there. Oh, what are we making here? Ben Hur? Come on, guys, let's go. Can't be that hard. Waddle and Sylvie, we are live with Coach Ditka's golf outing. Lance Briggs wanting more money, and if he doesn't get it, he's going to demand a trade at the end of this season. What do you think of that, Coach? When you sign a contract, you have an obligation. It says, okay, we're going to pay you this much money over this much time. Then all of a sudden, after you have a good year, well, that contract's no good anymore. I want a new one. You can't do it. Yeah, but he's been really good. Oh, uh, yeah, but if he's really good, then maybe he'll be good somewhere else, too. <laughs> to Mike Ditka, there is no holier contract than that between player and coach. When the players went on strike during the 1987 season, that contract began to unravel. For him not to be a union guy and to kind of go company on you was, I think, a real surprise to, to people. Well, who said the unions are always right? My dad didn't say they were always right either. And my dad didn't defend a worker who didn't want to work. Somebody said, the guys you're coaching are going on strike, but we're going to play football anyway, so we're going to get you a bunch of other guys. You coach them and you play. What are you going to say? They have names like Kozlowski and Napsik, Rodenhauser and Wojciechowski. They may be anonymous, but they continue to keep the Bears a team to be feared. I would say, yeah, we're probably a Grabowski team. They're playing for the Chicago Bears, and I'm very proud of that. When they had the labor problems and he called the replacements the real Bears, that turned a lot of his guys cool to him. Because you didn't have to, you didn't have to on the players. Mm -hmm. you, it wasn't necessary. But to, to say that, you know, these are my guys really hurt. I'm just very proud of the kids, the way they play. They play hard. My kind of guys. I know that he lost a lot of guys after that. I heard, I heard all the guys that whined and complained, yeah. 
And if I lost them, that's fine. Then they probably went somewhere else. Ditka lost a few hearts in the locker room. A year later, he nearly lost his life. Topping our news today at 4.30, the coach of the Chicago Bears, Mike Ditka, recovering tonight from a heart attack. At this hour, Coach Ditka is in serious condition at Lake Forest Hospital. That heart attack. I was working out and I got done working out and I felt bad. I couldn't stop sweating for one thing. And uh, I was lucky they got me to go to the hospital because normally I didn't want to go. Man, I can't be having a heart attack. You know, I'm Iron Mike. I'm having, how can I be having a heart attack? And you're having a heart attack. It was very scary. I was 48 years old and I had no idea that anything like that could happen to somebody that young. Probably it was from, uh, uh, I had a little bit on my mind at that time. So I just got to be careful and uh, I'll change a little bit the way I eat and the way I work and uh, the way I live. So that ought, to, that ought to help a lot. Mike Ditka was out to prove he was not making a mistake, returning to the field just 11 days after his heart attack. The 1988 Bears finished 12-4 and four, and Iron Mike was voted Coach of the Year for a second time. But the new and improved Ditka didn't last. What is it? You got it? A blunt lead? Down 49 G. No, 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 not Dive G. I thought, I thought that. Oh, Greg. The most memorable explosion came at the expense of Jim Harbaugh in 1992. We talked about it all week. We were going to play the Vikings in the Metrodome, a notoriously loud place to play. He said, look, we're not going to audible. I don't care what look you get. We're going to send the play in, and you run it. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something different. But we're not going to expose ourselves to any mistakes because of the surroundings. Well, we got into the game, and wouldn't you know Jim audibles? Now Anderson shifts to a receiver position at the top of the screen. And the funny thing is, it was the right play to call, but Neil Anderson, who was split wide, didn't hear the audible. Look out, here it goes. Interception, Todd Scott. Touchdown, Minnesota. And look at Ditka getting all over Harbaugh. I'll paraphrase there. I can't believe you threw that ball. I don't think he was open. What were you thinking? That you know, turned the game totally against us, and we ended up getting beat 21 to 20. Probably one of the top five worst things I think of in my entire life. And for the Bears, this has got to be a killer. I'm going to say one thing. 399 of the plays I've been calm and one I've been excited. Yet you son of a made a big deal out of it. That's life. Coach, I've respected you. That's well, the first time I've ever been called that name. Well, good. I'm glad you respected me. Anything else? I took it too hard. I put too much pressure probably on too many people. And, uh, you know, people forget, oh, I did the same thing in 84 and 85, and it worked. And then for that, I was a genius. But all of a sudden, now I was a bully. As the losses mounted, the coach who wore his heart on his sleeve couldn't keep his emotions in check. The shouting matches on the sideline scared the hell out of me a lot just because, you know, the personality, but that's how we felt. We stunk. We stink. We are absolutely a, an atrocious football team at this point right now. I don't know if we're capable of winning another football game. I don't think we are at this point. We'll keep trying. If they let me try, I'm going to try. If they don't, I'll, I'll be doing something else. That's all. Ultimately, the Bears decided to part with their coach of 11 years. I've had my run-ins with you guys, and I've had a lot of support from you. I appreciate it. I thank you. I thank the fans of this city. You know, the, the Bears will come back. I don't worry about that. It's, it's pretty hard to erase 17 years. This too shall pass. We love you, Mike. Nick, your voice not on. Okay, okay. okay. No, 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 fellas, fellas, gangs, be careful. You're going to fall through the... You're going to get hurt, and then I'm going to get sued, and they're going to blame me, and I'm not the positive this problem. Okay, I got you. Okay, I got you. Now, what do you want to know? If I say I'm not depressed, I would be a liar. This is the greatest city in America for sports. But someday I might have to come back as an opponent. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. Happy New Year. Come back and look for Ditka returned five years later 
as the head coach of the New Orleans Saints. The head and heart were there. The talent wasn't. Patriots blitz him off the corners, and he's thrown it right to the defensive lineman. Like I said, we did have a few too many quarterbacks at times, and then when you have too many, you don't have one. That's a shame, man. That's a shame. That's going to happen when you play people that can't play. Oh, that'll happen. We've had some bad luck, but you know, hey, you know, before you can have a rainbow, you got to have a little rain. In a fit of desperation, Ditka traded all of his 1999 draft picks for Ricky Williams, a throwback runner who reminded Ditka of himself. <laughs> this is my reasoning, whether it's right or wrong. I thought the New Orleans needed a guy to market, and he would be a good player. Was it given up too much? Absolutely. Absolutely it was given up too much, but I thought we needed one guy to build the team around. I thought he could be the guy. So if we're wrong, throw sticks and stones at us, but if we're right, you know, which I know we're right, so we'll just see what happens. Although their union was more sideshow than success, the old school coach had an impact on Ricky Williams. It was a great lesson in toughness at a very young point in my career. I remember I had a turf toe injury and I ended up missing four games. I thought I was just going to sit out the rest of the season. And uh, he called me into his office and he went on to say when he played there was no such thing as turf toe. Needless to say, after that talk I ended up playing in the last two games. Big effort, Rick. Good job. Ditka always had in the back of his mind, Ricky Williams can be my Walter Payton. He loved Ricky Williams, but Ricky Williams was not Walter Payton. New Orleans was not Chicago. There was nothing about it that was the same with the players that he had. Get him out of there. He ain't gonna make our football team. After a three and 13 season, Coach Ditka left the sidelines for good. First of all, no one likes to be fired. And I've been fired twice. You know, it, it could have been better, but it wasn't. But I'll tell you one thing, the going up was worth the coming down. Today, I am proud to say to the 1985 Bears, welcome to the White House for this well-deserved and long overdue recognition. They were, of course, led by the coach who set the tone, Hall of Famer Mike Ditka. Back in 2004, when I was running for the Senate, some people were trying to draft Ditka to run against me. I will admit, I was a little worried, because he doesn't lose. Well, he was a Tea Party guy years before people were uh, even thinking about tea. She will make a great Vice President of the United States. Of course, to the coach, Mike Ditka, thank you so much. Ditka's larger-than-life personality still resonates today. He is still blunt and outspoken and still very much in demand as a speaker, endorser, and actor. You're my assistant, okay? You're supposed to back me up and go get me juice boxes when I tell you. Now go get me a juice box. You know who you're talking to. I'm talking to the juice box guy. You're crazy. Well, I'm not crazy. I'm just thirsty. Why don't you go to hell? No, you go to hell. While you're there, why don't you grab me a juice box? I'm no juice box boy, I'll tell you that. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Do you call him the juice box boy at home? No. <laughs> Would you? <laughs> the people embrace him because he is who he is and he's approachable, he's very honest, and I've never seen anyone at his level or stature really ever connect with the people the way that, that Mike has over the course of time. How's it going, coach? All right. We need you back coaching. No, we don't. <laughs> Let's get another question from the audience for coach. I'm Brian from Plainfield. Coach, my wife is five months pregnant, <laughs> and I need to know this. May I name my child, my boy child, my first boy child, Dicta? Oh, that's okay with me, but he's liable to be really pissed off at you through his life. <laughs> Doc Coach has deftly walked a fine line between being blue collar and being a blue blood. He's a Grabowski, yeah, but he belongs to exclusive golf clubs and he makes a fortune and he owns restaurants. I don't think he flies coach. So it's not like he's uh, slugging it out for his next buck. 
if he was one living high on the hog from the sport of football and didn't give back, maybe there's a contradiction there. As the face of gridiron greats, Ditka is a passionate advocate on behalf of retired players who have fallen on hard times. The organization provides financial assistance to former pros who need medical care and other basic necessities. Well, you think the world of him, you know, because he, he was a guy who stepped up. He was a guy who got in front of the cameras and said, hey, this is wrong. Every time we try to do something, somebody points the finger at us and says, oh, you know, you're wrong. Or somebody from the NFLPA says, well, you can't do that. Well, why can't we do it? What's wrong with it? Why haven't you done it? Why haven't you cared enough to do something? I watched John Mackey go, you know, from, you know, from a regular guy down to where he was a kid. Doug Atkins was living in a trailer in Tennessee, can't even pay his electric bill, has no money. I don't know how he's living. If you want to call that living, it's not living, really. Every time he sees one of them, I know that he's thinking, thank God that's not me. But physically, he's a wreck. I'm all right. If I had two new knees, I'd be great. I mean, I don't know what else you could replace on the guy. That, that walk is classic. I've had four hip replacements. I probably need a shoulder done. Um, I'm getting a little forgetful, but you know, it doesn't, I, it's part of the game. He's Iron Mike. <laughs> like, I'll say, uh, are you hurting? I am Iron Mike. <laughs> I don't hurt, he's hurting. Football doesn't owe me anything. I owe my whole life to football. If somebody said, okay, here's what's going to happen to you. When you're 72, you're going to feel this way. Will you play the game? I said, absolutely, I'd play the game. And I'd even play it harder than I played it. Mike Ditka played and coached as hard as anyone in NFL history. I've never known anybody quite like Mike Ditka. He was one of a kind. He's the epitome of what Chicago wanted in a football player and a football coach. Ditka stood for more than, you know, winning and losing. He just had that little look about him that said, we're going to kick some butt today, but we're also going to have a little fun doing it. And we're going to share it with you, the fans. There just aren't enough people like Mike Ditka in the world. They, their edges have been sanded off. Remember this, everywhere you go, there you are. See the same people going up as you do coming down. You know, I think Sinatra said it pretty good. Regrets I had a few, but then again, too few to mention. I think you always have a few regrets. But, you know, if you live in the past, you die in the past. I'm not going to go back and rehash all the stuff that people want to rehash. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you win more? Why did you do... Why? I don't want to do that. I mean, you, you got to live in the moment. I don't care what you've ever done in your life. It has nothing to do with what you're going to do now or what you can do. You know, the past is history. Tomorrow's a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. 